Blessings, shalom, welcome to Come Home. I'm Jen Mallon and I'm so happy you're with us today. Do you have a dream? Do you have a vision? Do you have a God assignment? Is there something that has been burning in your heart and yet you don't know how to give birth to it? You don't know how to deliver it. You don't know how to communicate it. You don't know how to pin it or capture it. And you've just been saying, God, please send help. God, please show me how to do it. I need an Aaron. I need an Ur. I need assistance. I need angels. I need something. Well, today, I think, in fact, I'm really sure that God has some answers for you. See, when he gives us a dream and he gives us a vision, then he is responsible for carrying that out. And guess what Jesus does? He uses people. He uses people to help us. And I have a wonderful guest today, uh, actually two. The first wonderful guest is my amazing husband, Rob Mallon. And the second guest is a new friend. And his name is Peterson Harrard. And he is going to be sharing about his life, his God story. He is one of 18 children. He's gonna share some great humor about his childhood and his teenage years and God's mercy and grace, his family. And then he's going to share about something that happens to so many of us. In fact, it could be happening to you right now. He had everything that a young man could want, and yet he found himself burnt out, working, and not being able to do the things he loved and enjoyed. And so the Lord helped him transition, walk by faith, take a huge risk, and now he has a wonderful corporation and business. He's an author. He helps people like you with marketing, with sales, with branding, and with packaging your God assignment. He is taking the business mountain by storm, and he's helping people that have a God message. So you're going to hear about this wonderful book, Servicepreneurship. Isn't that a cool word? I'm sure he coined that. But um, it's going to be a blessing, and so stay tuned. Enjoy my husband and Peterson. They, they have dynamic energy together. But before we go to them, we're going to go to my friend, Karen Stalley, and she's going to talk about emotional wounding and how the Holy Spirit joins us and helps us and gets us free, helps us overcome, and gets us on the other side. Then we'll be right with Rob and Peterson. One of the main things that will stop anyone from walking in the full measure of who God called them to be is emotional wounds. Emotional wounds live in your soul, where your mind, your will, and your emotions are. Now, if you find that you have a wounded soul, that means likely that your mind, will, and emotions have been affected by your experiences, your environment, or the examples that you have been in. Now, if you're wounded, you're not able to operate the way you need to operate, the way God needs you to function. So you need to get healed in those areas, how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And we do this by spending time with the Lord. We do this by allowing Him to not only charge up our faith, but also help us to be refilled with hope. The difference between faith and hope, faith is a free gift, right? It lives in your spirit. But hope lives in your soul, and hope speaks to the future. Faith now is, hope speaks to the future. So I declare over everyone watching, Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord knows the plans that he has for you, right? They're not bad, they're not evil plans, they're good plans to give you a hope and a future. So if you feel a little stuck and your faith is on fire, it might be that you need some hope. So sit in the presence of the Lord and ask Him to fill you up. Say, Lord, fill me with fresh hope in Jesus' name. Pete, welcome to the show, man. Great to have you. Such a blessing. Uh, we have been working together for quite some time now, and to have you on the show, to be able to share with the world what's going on is pretty amazing. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Rob. Super excited to be here. Thank you, thank you. So you've got a God story. Before we jump into, you know, what you do, let's talk about your God story for just a minute because it really is intriguing. You haven't always lived in the U.S., right? Nope. Tell, uh, tell me where, where you're from originally. So originally from Haiti. Okay, and when did you come here? I came to the United States when I was about nine years old. Okay, fantastic. And tell me what happened because this is a great story. What happened while you were here for the first time? So I came here to the United States for the first time, and obviously I'm new in the country. I don't speak English. Um, going to school, and my mom, we left, it was me and my brother, we left my mom in Haiti, 
um, and my dad brought us here. Um, and I was just like a typical teenager, just started hanging out with the wrong crowd. Uh, I remember I lived in Immokalee, Florida, which is a small town just okay. on the outskirts of Naples, uh, where I currently live. And I was just doing the wrong things. I was getting straight Fs in school. Um, I remember one time I looked at my report card and there was not a single D or C. It was just F, 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 failing wow. every single class and um, just hanging out with the wrong crowd. I remember going to, uh, they had a local Walgreens and I remember um, going there and stealing things with other kids because it was cool, because it was the cool thing to do just to fit in. So I was just doing the wrong things. Um, and just didn't care. I didn't and, and what happened as a result of that? As a result of that, uh, my dad and others in the family thought it was a very um, it was fit, it was fit to send me back to Haiti. So your punishment was going back to Haiti. <laughs> my punishment was going back to Haiti. It's, 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 it's every Haitian kid's punishment. <laughs> <laughs> so so you go back to Haiti, and how did you how do you get back to the U.S.? What happens? So I go back to Haiti for a year, okay. and it was night and day because I was I had a fridge to go into whenever I felt like it. I had electricity 24 seven and I had a warm bed. I had just, it was just, I was living in luxury. <laughs> and then I go back to Haiti and it's like, okay, well, the electricity only comes when the government decides to put it on whatever, um, whatever section you live in, right? And it's not 24 um, seven. Because there's no electricity 24 seven, there's no fridge because you can't have things in the fridge that can go bad. So it was it was a wake up call. So it was a wake up call, and then eventually, I, I remember I went to I spent one year in Haiti, and my auntie and my uncle decided, hey, it's time to bring him back. Don't leave him out there because it's not safe. Um, I, I don't want him to be uh, left alone, and his brother's here. So bring him back, and I'll take him in. So who did you who did you? So you're staying with your uncle now. I stayed with my uncle. Okay. So after I came back from Haiti, so they brought me back in. And then I started to live with my uncle Eli. That's right. And that's when everything took everything changed for me. So, so what did Eli? What were some of the rules so, to stay in his home? So I came in um, <laughs> first night in. Uh, I remember dropping to the airport. He didn't say much to me, and I remember um, once we got in, he fed me. I went to sleep, and then I woke up, and then he gave me the talk. And first thing he says in my house, every Sunday we go to church. That's right. And he's gonna say, "You're gonna live. You're gonna live in my house. You're gonna abide by my rules." And if you don't like it, you can get out. And I'm like, well, I don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> so you're going to do it, right? So I'm going to do it. So um, that's how it started. So every Sunday, uh, and I remember vividly, um, if it was 9 o'clock and he didn't hear me, and I sometimes I'd like, I'd like to sleep in, I'd just hear this loud, obnoxious knock on my door. Boom, boom, boom. Time for church. Time for church. And he had an accent, like, get up. Time for church. Time for church. And I was just like, oh. Why do I have to go to church? It's like, why can't I? Why can't you guys just go? Why do I have to go to church? So originally, <laughs> you were going to church because you sort of had to. Yeah. But then something happened. Yeah. Something happened. Tell me, tell me what happened that caused you to actually make a real shift towards God. So what happened? I was living with my uncle. We started going to church, and we went to a Haitian, we went to a Haitian church at the time, and it was cool. I liked it, but the thing, the, the only drawback was that sometimes I didn't really understand the sermon because Haitian pastors have this thing they do where they go from Creole to French and right. French to Creole. Right. And for kids that you know, now I've learned I learned English, so it's like um, okay. you're Americanized. Yeah, I'm Americanized <laughs> now. So. Uh, Sophomore year, I believe it was junior year of high school. Um, again, I struggled a lot. You know, I think not growing up with my dad and just not having just my uncle at the time. He was my father figure. So sure. um, a lot of identity issues that I was going through, a lot of just trying to fit in, you know, trying to be cool. Because that's if every kid was doing it, oh, I wanted to do it too because I wanted to fit in. And I remember vividly, um, it was one day, it was supposed to be an early release day. And I was horse playing with another kid in the, uh, in the hallway. The bell rang. It was time to switch classes. I was horse playing around the hallway, and I pulled the fire alarm. Mm. And I pulled the fire alarm, and instead of going to tell one of the school administrators what had happened and that, you know, I'm the one that did it just to prevent, um, you know, the fire trucks and everything from coming, I evacuated with the kids like nothing happened. <laughs> and the whole school, and we're talking about a school with over five, like 5,000 students, whole school evacuated fire trucks coming to the school, cop cars everywhere. And then I'm like, man, this is serious. Yeah, This is some serious stuff. And um, as everybody came back into 
the room and they looked at the camera. They saw it was me. And I saw the school demonstrator from far away screaming, Peterson! <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is bad. Yeah. <laughs> this is bad. So I go to the office and um, find out because even though they like me, they know it was it was a stupid decision. It counted as a uh, it counted as a felony. Wow! Pulling the fire alarm, um, and eventually I got arrested. And before they arrested me, they had to call my uncle to let him know what was happening. And the police officer, I remember, deputy counsel was the one that well, I was in his office. He called my uncle, oh, and I can tell he was upset. And he was just like, I've been in this country for 20 plus years, and the only trouble I got was a speeding ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh God, I'm going back to Haiti. <laughs> I'm going back to Haiti. I was scared because I knew, and, um, and my uncle, to make, to make matters worse, he didn't know where the jail was. Wow. He's been in Naples for oh over 20 He did not know where the no jail clue. was until I got in there. And so long story short, my uncle came, he was mad, he's like, you're going right back to Haiti. And I was just like, oh my goodness, I don't want to go back to Haiti. And so I had to face the judge and the judge came in. And this is how I know it was God because um, I came in front of the judge and the judge looked at me. He's like, she's like, you've never been arrested before. No, ma'am. And then she looked at me, she looked at my record and looked at my report card and my school notes. And she said, you have a 3.9 GPA. Look at me. I don't want to see you here again. Do you understand? I said, yes, ma'am. And then I went back to the, uh, to the clerk, and all I had to do was write an apology letter to the school and to the fire department, and oh, that was it. So that's just some real grace and some real mercy. So in real that. grace and mercy, and I was like, that was God looking out for me. And ever since, I started taking, started taking God serious because I knew that this issue could have ended way worse than it, than it was. Could have been way worse. Now, God's been speaking to you, and then you also have another encounter where I think you make a full commitment or originally where a girl had invited you or actually told you yeah. if you wanted to date her, you had to be a serious man. You had to be a serious man of God. Yeah. Tell, me, tell me about that for just a minute and then what happened. And then we're going to talk about your book. Yeah. So um, I started going to college. I graduated high school. I started going to, um, at the time, Edison College in Naples. Uh, now it's called Florida Southwestern State College. And I started going. There was this beautiful girl there before. Um, her name was Claire. And I was like, okay, cool. So in sociology class, I would always sit next to her. And then I would always, you know, talk to her, trying to get her to go on dates and everything like that. And she wasn't having it. <laughs> she wasn't having it. And one of the things she told me, she was like, you know what? You're not, a, you're not a man of God. And she was like, you have to go to church. I go to church. I'm a Christian. And anybody that wants to date me, have to be in church. And I was like, well, I've tried this church thing. I don't know any churches around here. And at the time, I still live with my uncle. And I'm like, I want to serve God, but I don't know any other churches. And I don't like going to the church I'm going to. And she said, well, there's a church right in Golden Gate. It's called New Life Church. It's um, Pastor Paul. So I think you should go there and Paul you'd Getter. like it. Paul Getter. That's awesome. And I go there and my intention was, you know what? I'm only going to go there because she's very pretty and I want to eventually date her. So I stepped in and I've never stepped foot out. Wow. So, <laughs> now, so this is amazing. So you, you've gone from Haiti to going back to ha coming to the U.S., going back to Haiti, yeah. coming back to the U.S., being threatened to go back to Haiti. Yeah. Then you have a God encounter, and your life starts evolving. You graduate from college. You start getting involved in church. Uh, you're involved in the banking industry, the financial industry. Yeah. You're being very successful in that area. And then you have uh, children yeah. and a daughter. And now uh, God starts speaking to you about entrepreneurship. You yeah. wanted to leverage yourself and uh, be more available to your family and not so much tied to a nine to five job. Yeah. So you brought this book, you come out with this book, Servicepreneurship. Tell me a little bit about servicepreneurship and how this evolved. So, yeah, so uh, back in 2019, when my, my first daughter Layla was born, I was in the banking industry. I was working, going to work from 7 a.m. And I would not be returning um, to, I would not return home until 6 p.m. And at that time, my wife was going through postpartum depression, wow. and um, or postpartum, I think. Um, yeah, just going through that that whole stage, and I just she couldn't even shower until I got home, um, because she, the baby was crying. She had no help, so I just didn't want to see her like that. And I was also very unhappy at my job. I was very unhappy. I felt like I was miserable every day. Was like, oh, why do I have to do this? So, I just started praying about it. And um, 2019, I took a step of faith. Uh, it was exactly, uh, it was August. My daughter was born in August. And the next month, September, I, I took a um, step of faith and I quit. 
You never gone back. I've never gone back. I did not have a backup plan. I just quit cold turkey, and I was the number one banker in the district. And everybody's like, "What are you doing? Is it more money? We can pay you more." I'm like, no, this is different. So I just quit, and I started freelancing, utilizing some of the skills that I already knew. Um, I already, I was already utilizing in the banking industry. So I started freelancing, helping people with, you know, um, budgeting and you know finances and everything like that. And then I eventually learned marketing, and then I built a six-figure marketing agency. And um, that's when it hit me like, wow, if I can do this, a lot of people can do this because the same skills that you're using in your nine to five are the same skills that business owners, entrepreneurs, and everybody outside the nine to five are looking for. Um, They're looking to hire people with those skills. They're looking for people to have those skills and they pay more. That's right. (laughs) So So this book is going to help people basically uh, transition from a nine to five job mm -hmm. into uh, a, a a pathway of prosperity. Yeah, one hundred percent. And this book, yeah, this book is geared towards if you have a, if you're in a nine to five and you have a skill. It doesn't matter if you're in um, if it doesn't matter if you work at a TV network. It doesn't matter if you work in banking. It doesn't matter if you're in marketing. If you whatever, if you're a graphic designer, whatever it is, if you have a skill, this this book will teach you how to package that skill and find a niche into the marketplace and come in premium pricing. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I think that's important for a lot of people because a lot of people in the, you know, that are believers are looking for, you know, they're praying for prosperity. God, you know, uh, increase my wealth, do this. And a lot of times they, they think it's going to come through their job. And many times it can come through their gifting. It can come through mm-hmm. the, the very gift they're using now that can actually amplify that gift yeah, 100%. And, and leverage it and use it to start their own business. Yeah, correct? 100%. And that's, that's what you did. Yeah, that's what I did. That's um, fabulous. That's what I did. I think at the peak of my marketing uh, company, um, I was averaging, I was making, so when I was at the bank, my yearly salary was $60,000 at the bank. And that was me working from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and really not having time for myself, for my family, for my wife, because when I came home at 6 p.m., that means I only had a four to five hour window right. to spend with my family, to spend with my wife and my daughter before I had to go to sleep and wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning and make it to the bank to open it at 7 a.m. And at the peak of my agency, my uh, monthly my monthly income was around twenty thousand. That's fantastic. So if you have a skill, all you need is really a couple clients, two to four clients, depending on how much you charge. Which I tell you all about in this book. You can replace your full time income. That's right. By just having two to four clients. That's right, and I, say, and I love this too because it's not just the finances, which that's very, very key, but also for you, you need you wanted freedom back. Yeah. You wanted, you wanted your life back. 100%. You know, and I think that's what a lot of people want. Uh, they want a tool or they want a pathway that can give them finances, but can also give them their life back and can also give them time back with their family, which is what I'm hearing you say. You want a time back with your wife. Yeah. You want a time back with your children. Exactly. exactly. And, uh, and that's, what you've been, that's, that's what you've been able to do, correct? Yeah, 100%. 100%. And, 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 you know, I think one of the ways that I look at it as well is the fact that, you know, when you get time back, you get to spend not only more time with your family, but you don't have to ask for permission. You don't have to ask for permission to go on vacation. You don't have to ask for permission to go to a doctor's appointment. That's right. You're readily available with your kids and that's your right. family. I love that. And God, I think that I really believe that's God's plan. You know, you helped me. Speaking of time, uh, I had a manuscript and it was a manuscript, but yeah. it was not like <laughs> this. It was not a complete package. I didn't have an ISBN number. I didn't have, you know, uh, everything typeset correctly. I mean, it was just it was just <laughs> paper, you yeah. know. And you're able to take me in a very short period of time from paper. And my concept, yeah. actually, a completed project. Yes. So let's talk about uh, the new project that we're working on right now, uh, the author's launch pad. I know there's a lot of people that are believers that uh, have an idea, have a thought, have a message, and they want to amplify it. And like myself, um, you know, we just didn't have the resource at the time to complete the project uh, where it's in my hand, ready, available, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you were able to make that happen for me. What does the author's launch pad do, and, and how can it help a person like myself or someone who's wanting to put a book project together? Yeah, so the author's launch pad is pretty much after putting my book together and helping, about, I'd say, over 20 people 
um, become published authors, I realized there was a big crisis. A lot of, especially Christian pastors, leaders, people with TV ministries, and even business owners and entrepreneurs, they have a book idea. They want to write a book, but the process is just so daunting. Sure. The, they don't know where to begin. They don't know, okay, um, how do I outline the book? Where do I do this? Where do I do that? So I took all of these feedback, and that's what the Author's Lunchpad is. So the Author's Lunchpad is a done-for-you program where if you have a book idea or anything, you want to become a published author, you can become that without even having to type a word. So we handle everything from the cover design, the manuscript, helping you outline and format everything. We literally sit you down, we interview you, and we extract everything from your brain, and we put it down on paper, and then we give you a finished product. See, I love this. And that's where I think <clears throat> this author's launch pad is such a blessing because there are so many people that I, I get phone calls frequently, yeah. or you, you have people sending an email or text, you know, hey, I've got this book idea, I've got this manuscript, and I just don't know how to finish it. Or you have people that they'll get a, a book done and then it comes back and it's not professional. You yeah. know, you look at it and you're like, a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's unfortunate that people spend money and yeah. uh, they invest time. And I've seen so many people get frustrated and actually throw their project literally in the trash, yeah. you know, and just give up on it because they weren't able to bring it through. And I think that's such a shame because so many people have, you know, uh, an amazing message that God's put within them. And they just didn't have the, the resource or the, the, the right knowledge to make it happen. And that's where, uh, for me, I think the, author, the author's launch pad is going to be such a blessing to so many people mm -hmm. if they're interested in uh, putting the project together. A hundred percent. Because with the author's launch pad, you know, you don't have to do, you know, this person is doing the design, this person is doing this, this person is doing that. You just come. It's a one-stop shop. Um, one-stop shop. We sit you down. We get everything out of you. And then I'd say 90 days. 90 days is the average time, and I promise you'll have a published book that's going to be everywhere, and you're going to have a word that you're proud of that can inspire and touch others. Just above the book, it's just the ability to go ahead and say, wow, this is my name on there. That's right. I'm holding it. It feels real, and there's a message in there that can impact thousands, if not millions of people. Talk about the importance of that. Like, you know, there's a lot of people have a message, uh, and it can be a great one, but talk about the importance if you, if you have a message, and then all of a sudden you put it into a book form. How does, it, how does it transform that message uh, into now an intellectual, intellectual property that can be used for so many different things? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so we've had clients that use their books to get speaking engagements um, where they speak about topics that are passionate to them through nonprofits or other businesses that are looking for speakers. We've had clients that uses their book to, um, to, as a way to get people to get their products or their services. So having a book is really not only the message, but it's your way of saying, hey, I'm a credible person because I've been through it and I know what I'm talking about, and now I want to share it with the world. In addition to that, your book, uh, what we do, we put your book on Amazon, right. Barnes & Nobles, Ingram Spark. So you have millions, I mean, Amazon get billions of viewers a, a, a month. What about somebody who wanted to get like an ebook, audio book? All of that's included in the author's lunch pad. See, that's amazing. Yeah, so we, um, so, I mean, I, I know we don't have time to go over what everything includes, but you get the book, you get the audio book, the ebook, everything's done for you, and you get the press release to promote it, too. See, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a lot of value. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I want to ask this. I mean, I'm sitting here, and I'm, I'm very intrigued about this. I mean, I, I think about, because I've, I've been to Haiti many times myself. Uh, we have a medical center there in Wanamenth, uh, and we support uh, on a regular basis. And... I think about how unique your story is, and I think about how your story could have gone any different way. Yeah. It could have gone. Could have gone south. <laughs> could have gone south very quickly, and it did yeah. sort of go south <laughs> sort there for a minute, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but God intervened and, and, and turned your situation around where you went from just being a young, young man with no guidance, you know, and I can relate to that, and not having a father figure, and I can relate to that, to uh, having a relationship with God, uh, established relationship with the Father in heaven, and then God sends you into a church uh, to be discipled, and then, then the growth that takes place, and then here you are, a business person, yeah. uh, an author, and you're helping people uh, do, do branding, helping people with coaching, yeah. uh, helping people launch their books. Um, what could you say to a parent right now, or, or a, someone who has a loved one, a, a child, that... Uh, is not seeing the manifestation of what they would have hoped for in their child, uh, or what, what 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 hope could you bring from a from a Bible standpoint or from a God standpoint that you know 
uh, there's potential in every young person, and no matter what you're looking at, you know, God can turn that situation around. Is there something you might be able to speak to that for just a moment? Yeah, so the two things I'll say to parents that, you know, have a kid, and, you know, it's, you know, they're kind of like going, they're out there kind of like I was. Number one, never stop praying for them. That's right. Because I believe that Jesus can turn everyone around. Um, you know, you look at the prodigal son. He eventually came back to his senses and went back to the father's house. And the second thing I'll say is that um, be a friend more than a parent and during that time. Because one of the things that I've noticed is that if I had somebody to kind of talk to me, be my friend, and told me, hey, it's going to be all right, this, this is okay, um, you know, God loves you, this is somebody to kind of guide. I think there's a difference between parenting and friendship, right? For sure. Parenting, yes, you're, you're their parent, they have to do what you say, good, that's, I'm all for it. However, also be their friend, speak to them, seek to understand what they're going through, and I promise you, that alone can just be the spark that brings them back. I love that. And then to a business person, someone who just, like for example, you, you're, yeah. you're, you're working a nine to five, you're doing the typical hustle and grind. And you know, what would you say to that person who's trying to get off that track? Someone who's really trying to break away, but they are, seem to be stuck. They seem to have that you know, uh, chain stuck to the desk. They seem to be you know, stuck at that nine to five and mm-hmm. can't break uh, that cycle. What would you say to that person who, who not to give up or, or how, how do they break free from this? Yeah. So number one, I'd say, um, get my book. There you go. <laughs> I teach you how to do that in this book. And number two, um, pray, seek God and trust God. I think sometimes God speaks to us and we're ready to take that leap of faith, but we're just scared. And if you're scared, do it scared. God is with you. That's what I did. I did it scared and it worked out. I love because that. I know God was with me. I love that. Do it scared. And that's important. So Walking in faith does not necessarily mean there's not fear present, correct? Exactly, exactly. So even if fear is present, we're going to step out and do yeah. this anyway. Do it scared. Do Absolutely. it in faith do it. and do it scared. Do it in faith and do it scared. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask you to pray yes. uh, over uh, the folks that are looking to break free financially in 2024, that there's more and an open door in 2024. Mm-hmm. Uh, pray that God will uh, lead people uh, in, a, in a path of prosperity that they can actually do what this book is talking about. 100%. Awesome. So let's pray. All right. So wherever you're watching, just um, lift your hand up right now and just pray, Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for this opportunity. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And I pray for everybody that is watching this. I pray that you bless them, you lead them, and you give them the faith that they need to step out because we were not designed to be broke. We we're That's not right. designed to be poor. That's right. Everything that we need is in you. And I just pray this over them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pete, thank you so much thank you for so being on the much show. What a blessing, me, man. man. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to all the new projects and things that will be taking yeah. place in the future. Yeah, man, I'm excited. This is awesome. This is awesome. It was great. A thank lot you. of things happening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.